One thing I've appreciated with The Legend of Zelda, at least with its 3D titles, is how different each game feels from the other in terms of its gimmicks. I may not have played Twilight Princess or Skyward Sword just yet, but other titles like Wind Waker and Breath of the Wild, hell yeah, those games are cool as hell and I enjoy them for varying reasons. I don't talk about any of the 2D Zeldas just because I've never found myself being able to get into them very well, sorry. If I had to choose my favorite Zelda game though, Majora's Mask is easily my favorite of the bunch and just one of my favorite games ever. I don't need to do a deep dive into why I love this game so much because honestly, if you've ever heard someone explain why they love Majora's Mask, there's a good chance my opinion will match pretty close to it, gushing about its quirky and heartfelt characters, amazing art direction, and distinct atmosphere from other Zelda games. One aspect of the game I would like to talk about, however, is the game's starting area, Clocktown. Acting as your starting area and central hub for the game, this place works wonderfully well getting you adjusted to the strange world Link has fallen into, and features at least one species variant among the human townsfolk, letting you know what to expect from later areas of the game. Whether that be Deku or Goron businessman, a Zora musical manager, or an asshole thief who steals from old ladies. Disregarding the walk in townsfolk, the game still gives you enough to interact with and explore within the confines of the town. You have Octorok arrow shooting, getting potentially hit on by the owner of this treasure chest minigame, Bad boy. scaring these poor Deku scrubs by your wonderful flying skills, pissing off this couple by your wonderful bomb skills, or even just finding hidden spots with huge amounts of rupees. It all works well with getting you to understand the ins and outs of the town. Another way to getting accustomed to the town is with the help of the Bomber's Notebook, handed to you by the group known simply as the Bombers, kids who only want to do helpful community service around the town, without you actually seeing any of this occur, of course. With over 20 character spots to fill, a majority of them are centralized within the town, with others outside the town still connected to events within it. Once you interact with any of these characters simply once, the game will write them down in the notebook for future use. With the blue bar to represent when their problems happens, it gives the player something to solve when they're not focusing on the main objectives of dungeon exploring and unlocking the sleeping giants within. Because of how short Majora's Mask is in comparison to other 3D Zelda titles, in part due to its short dev time, the side quests littered throughout the world feel less like time wasters to run off the clock, and more like you're doing your part in helping the people of this world. I'd even go as far as to say that the player is nearly missing out on what makes Majora's Mask the game it is. That's a bold statement that'll vary from person to person, of course. I know a couple people who only went through the main campaign without tackling any of the non-mandatory side quests the game has. But in my case, even while I was simply recording footage for this video, I still found myself going out of my way to experience each story the people of Clocktown had, even with some of the more varied and out there tasks in the game, like Goron and Strange Beaver racing. Hell, I still haven't mentioned my love for the 3-day cycle system, the entire gimmick of the game. What simply acts as a threatening force for the player to accomplish story events without resetting the clock turns into an intricate task manager when including the side content of the game. Having to figure out where each character is, what their story is in the grand scheme of things, messing with the flow of time to slow down or fast forward, replays of this game are honestly my favorite aspect going back to it due to how different it can play out depending on which quest I decide to tackle first. One of the few tense moments I had while doing a recording session of the game was where I solved this gold Skotala house puzzle in the swamp with only a couple minutes remaining. After walking out, I then had to come face to face with the moon directly over my head. I could have just reset to the first day and tackled the puzzle from that point, but it was a fun self-accomplishing event knowing that I was able to finish it without falling under pressure. I'm sure there are more memories of events like this happening back when I played the game as a child. My initial playthrough of the game had me using a guide to navigate the game because I was that confused on where to and how to handle certain puzzles, but I still wanted to see the game through to the end because of how much it captivated me. It's honestly insane how much the dev team was able to stuff as much life into the content they had with this game with only a one year dev cycle, according to IG Ionuma, or at least as much as he or Nintendo has told us about the game. It only goes to show that crunching your dev team to release a product as quickly as possible is worth it if it can get the creative juices flowing. I could go on longer about just how much I love this game, but I've made that point clear enough as is. It captivated me as a child, and it still does now. And while I enjoyed the time I had replaying the game growing up, I had a pretty normal response after beating it. Wow, this game is so cool! I wonder if there's any other cool games like this one out there!
To be more specific, I was both fascinated and curious as to whether or not there were any other games released around this late 90s to early 2000s era that featured any similar style of gameplay. I've grown an appreciation for games around this era that pushed various technical aspects of the console, or rather were trying to adapt the standard 2D style of gameplay into a 3D format. You know, it was also that fun era where people were still trying to figure out how to adapt 2D graphics into a 3D format, whether that be with cartoony aesthetics or trying to attempt a more realistic style in its caricatures. When talking about these games as well, I don't want to get too tied up in the semantics over what genre I would categorize these games into. I'm not going to be too worried about it though. If big gaming events are able to have these weird ideas as to what each game is categorized into, fuck it, I'll go ahead and do the same. Really for me, an adventure game with puzzles centered around helping others or just living in an interactive world would help capture that aspect of Majora's Mask side quest system that I wanted to see a full focus on. Characters that have their own schedule or activities to follow throughout the day, a day and night system, or any indication of time passing and changing the environment around you, or even just a more story-oriented game that would be fun so long as it focused on helping and completing tasks for others. Social sims like Animal Crossing or Stardew Valley would somewhat fit this mold, but a strict single-player title is something that I wanted to experience more often than not. This will end up being a combination of a retrospective on each game and a way to examine each one's differing mechanics, as well as discussing the developers who are able to bring their visions to life. I both enjoy and dislike certain elements these games have, but at the end of the day, I still appreciate each one for varying reasons. And what better way to start off than with one of the biggest cinematic experiences of its era, Shenmue. Easily the biggest game featured here that I'll be discussing. The legacy Shenmue currently has among fans and outsiders I find to be weirdly fascinating. It feels like growing up the series was held to a pretty high standard for the accomplishments it achieved, and probably the long wait it took for the third entry to release. It was considered one of the biggest announcements alongside the likes of Team Eco's next title, The Last Guardian, and Final Fantasy VII Remake, as well as having the largest funded Kickstarter project at the time of its creation. To me it seems that, unless you grew up to witness the release of Shenmue, the wonder and appreciation of the game would seem almost confusing. What made this game special back in 1999, it feels more antiquated to what people currently expect out of AAA game studios. I was personally interested in getting into the series with the third entry slowly approaching in 2019, and while I've only played through the first game, twice now thanks to this video, I can say that I enjoyed this game with its faults and all. The story and cinematography is at the forefront of Shenmue, following 18-year-old martial arts trainee, Ryo Hazuki, who plans on getting revenge on the man who killed his father, Lan Di. Within his local neighborhood in Market Town, Ryu attempts to gain any knowledge on Lan Di's whereabouts or information on assailants of the murderous martial artist. This encompasses a majority of the gameplay, as Ryo goes through trial and error speaking to each townsfolk. With a journal in hand, thankfully, he writes down any important facts that can be used for story progression and it doesn't require the player to write any of this down. As a side note, I love the way Ryo writes some of his messages. A creepy skinhead tried to steal the phoenix mirror. I don't want to worry Ine-san, I'll get to Hong Kong on my own. What? Ah! We found the kitten. I'm sure Megumi's happy. I think she likes this food. It must taste good. I'll bring more again soon. Great! Thank you, Dio. At first, they can be confusing on who or what qualifies as a person of interest due to the game not having any markers or a minimap to help pinpoint exact locations, though there are maps sprinkled throughout areas of the game that can get you accustomed to where everything is. It's definitely purposeful, however, as the game really wants to put an emphasis on the player immersing themselves into the world. It helps to know the daily lives of each local in the town to know where you can press them for more questions, even if some NPCs are just there for dialogue fluff. Um, I'm sorry. I don't feel comfortable talking with strange men. Bye. Um, what you want, twit? Okay, bastard! Even when the game has you go outside of town to a local harbor, the same principles apply here in how you interact with the characters. Until you get to doing forklift minigames. While I enjoy these moments and interacting with the hilarious cast of characters, the game will include moments to break up the somewhat monotonous pace, such as the engaging QTE sections. 
I actually don't mind the QTE events, especially since there is not much of a consequence if you fail them outside of just restarting it, and it's also pretty funny watching what happens sometimes when you mess up. You think you got me, huh? <laughs> He wasn't so tough. The brawling sections that show up soon after, however, yeah, I could do without them personally. They happen too infrequently for me to get a handle on my moveset, which there are plenty of moves, mind you, and having to apply them throughout each fight doesn't feel as smooth as I'd like it to be. I sometimes just press buttons in the hopes something good happens, or memorize at least one or two command inputs for easy damage. The game does have areas where you can practice moves, even if there's no enemy or practice dummy to lash out at. Who knows, I wouldn't be surprised if I was just a dumbass and the fighting is actually decent enough to where enemies aren't a problem. Funny enough, it was only through me recording a second playthrough of the game that I realized you can even buy scrolls for new moves. This isn't even a building you never go to, it has importance in the story where Ryo gains a crucial clue against Landy. I just never thought I could go back and see if there was anything else new in this building. A revelation like that, however, ends up showing one of the more fascinating aspects I have while playing Shenmue. With how compact this world can be and what you can interact with, there's little moments or activities you can just miss out on that never hinder your experience of the story. As an example, occasionally you can run into a character that Ryo decides to help out as a sign of good faith, and that's about it. There's nothing else you can really gain from this outside of just being a nice Samaritan. Or I guess achievements if you play the ports of both titles. As you go through the story and gain information from certain townsfolk, there's moments where you'll have to end up waiting a few hours or until the next day until said event becomes available to you. During this downtime, you can explore and interact with the quick activities that the town has to offer, whether that be losing money at a pachinko parlor or just spending time at the arcade playing classic Sega arcade games. At the peak of all this is the timeless act of gacha collecting throughout all areas of the game. It's cute being able to collect a variety of Sega memorabilia in an era where these properties wouldn't exist yet, but who cares, it's just a cute little video game easter egg. With the side activities combined with the main game, it really is impressive just seeing how big of a scope that Shenmue is trying to achieve, and it's not that surprising to hear that the game faced its own hurdles while in development. At the head of Shenmue's development was Sega veteran Yu Suzuki, who in the initial plan of the game wanted to develop an RPG for the Saturn that was set within the Virtua Fighter universe, another Sega franchise that Yu Suzuki was director of. Watching several interviews with Suzuki discussing the game is a neat and informative watch for anyone interested in the game's development. My personal choice is his GDC panel from 2014, which goes into pretty thorough detail about how certain gameplay mechanics were designed. Probably the most interesting one for me to discover, however, was this 30-minute interview which was a bonus disc included with the Japanese release of Virtua Fighter 3 TB for the Dreamcast. The presentation has Suzuki reflect on his past endeavors before teasing his next project, with the code name of Project Berkeley. While once again iterating the project would start life as an RPG, he dubs the game under a new genre he thought of, simply called Free, to help describe the leisure, full, and gentle nature of the game. Nowadays, it'd be easier to just describe Shenmue as an open-world adventure game, but I find it cool to see a game dev at this period of time try and describe their new game, especially for a genre that wasn't that technically far ahead to design for most game studios. Though I don't know if there were many other game studios that could find success in a title that was funded to be around $70 million, the most expensive game at the time to be developed. Having it released late into the Dreamcast's life cycle especially didn't do the game any favors, almost like it was doomed to fail from the beginning. If there is one thing you can not say though, is that the money went to waste designing everything in the game. I mean, we even got Mario's Pizzeria included. It's a margarita. It's Nozomi's favorite. I make a real fast, huh? Thanks, but not today. Shenmue, at least of what I've played of the first game, is a relaxing experience in watching the story unfold. Even if the team was still figuring things out with the gameplay, I find just running around the small town setting to be my favorite part of returning to this game. The soundtrack too complements the world wonderfully well and adds to the cozy atmosphere. While I've mainly focused on talking about the first game, I'd love to talk more about Shenmue 2 in the future of the series, but I think you're able to get the big picture. I did have intentions of sharing my first time playing through the second game though, uh, because of unforeseen circumstances with the game constantly crashing on PC and not wanting to deal with that issue in the second game, I think I'm just going to go ahead and wait for when the game goes on sale on console, that's the only way I'm going to be able to play through that game. Disregarding that issue, Shenmue is still a pretty unique experience and one that I honestly recommend to others to give it a try. 
I've understandably seen people detest the game, and its gameplay isn't for everyone, I can agree with that. However, if say, for example, you want to experience the story but don't mesh well with the gameplay, I recommend the anime that's been recently airing on Adult Swim. I've only watched a couple episodes myself, but it does a good job condensing the story for a TV format, and it's something I personally hope can tell the entirety of the story without having to wait for however many games it takes to share Suzuki's vision with the world. Speaking of creator visions, the next game I'd like to discuss, while much smaller in scale, comes from an indie studio in Japan with a unique approach to a game during the PS1 era. This is Moon Remix RPG Adventure, or just Moon as I'll call it. This was a once Japan only title released by a newly formed indie studio, Love Day Leak, an 8 man studio that consisted of former Squaresoft devs, a few that had worked on the likes of Chrono Trigger or Super Mario RPG. The studio unfortunately didn't last long, only lasting for around 5 years, and the three projects they had created never saw international release, not surprising considering the small status of the company. Many years later, however, would see the return of a few of Love Deleak's members coming together to form the new indie studio, Onion Games, led by Yoshiro Kimura. After a few small game outputs, the studio was able to not only see a next-gen release of Moon in Japan, but a full English localization helmed by former Kotaku journalist and translator, Tim Rogers. Releasing worldwide on August 27th, 2021, the game was now available for more players to experience, and it was a game that I was immediately interested in playing once I learned of its existence. The premise of Moon is that you play as a young boy who suddenly gets sucked into the world of the RPG game he nearly finished. Having found himself at the beginning of the RPG story and with no immediate way of escaping, the boy is taken in by an elderly woman who mistakes him for her now deceased grandson. Heading to bed has the boy come face to face with the head of a deity who welcomes and explains the rules of the land. The world of Moon is a place that runs on love and it can unlock the untouchable. And, if the boy is to travel the land and open the door to light, he'll need to ripen his heart and connect with love. Since the boy is living out the story of the RPG, the purpose of him saving Moon World is due to the strange actions done by the supposed hero employed by the king. This lanky blue knight is a cold and ruthless hero who ransacks local people's homes for loot, kills any moving creature with ease for experience, and seemingly lives for the destruction of things around him. To put it simply, his actions reflect that of a Zelda or RPG parody cartoon you'd find on Newgrounds. When I said dangerous, I was talking about the guards, you fuckhead. In reality, Moon is a subversive and playful joke on the tropes that had become standard in RPGs of this era. What if the monsters that roam these lands and are perceived as being evil and destructive are actually gentle and harmless creatures? Instead of killing the monsters, you attempt to help them out, and not just the monsters, but citizens as well. Maybe the local townspeople have more to them than meets the eye, and aren't just brash or archetypal character NPCs. Maybe there's a chance this game had a possible influence on another indie game, one with a lasting impact and tagline of being an RPG where you don't have to kill anybody. Obvious solutions aside, it's been outright stated by Toby Fox himself that Moon definitely had some influence when designing Undertale. Not only that, but he even met and talked with Yoshiro Kimura of Onion Games, whose encouraging words pushed Kimura to want to get a localized version of Moon out into the world in the first place. Safe to say, if you enjoy Undertale for any reason involving the story or characters within it, there's a good chance you'll have a great time with Moon. Diving into the gameplay, Moon plays out similarly to completing quests for the Bomber's Notebook in Majora's Mask. Each character has a schedule they follow that's also determined by the ever-changing time of the clock, not to mention, there's even specific days things can happen. By exchanging business cards with each person, you gain valuable information on how to help out each citizen, or just learn their relationships with other townsfolk. Complete a task for them, and you gain love from them. Outside of helping citizens, you also have monsters that cover the land, or rather the corpse of one slain by the hero. Reviving these monsters is done by examining an encyclopedia entry of them which gives clues on how to revive their spirit. Some range from just waiting at specific times of the day, others are by performing certain puzzles. Once you gain love, you can go to bed, get tallied on all the love you obtained, and level up. 
Leveling up increases the amount of time you can wander around and explore before this arrow on the clock indicates you passing up from exhaustion, I guess. This is what the love deity meant by obtaining love to explore more levels, by the way. It is a strange system, I'm not gonna lie. It feels weird to say, but I recommend checking out the digital instruction manual that comes with Moon, which you can find on the Onion Games website. It goes into much bigger depth into the mechanics of the game, and also gives you tips on how to progress through your journey. You could use a guide on the internet, that works just fine, but I find it to be a somewhat nostalgic experience having to use just the instruction manual included with the game to figure things out in an era where the internet just wasn't so common to get tips on how to beat the game. Outside of the timer signifying death though, Moon is more or less a pretty calm experience. With love being at the center of the game's message, you never feel at risk of danger from anything around you. It's nice to just take in your surroundings and see what you can interact with to progress the story. Occasionally, you do have moments of just waiting to pass the time, though not nearly as much compared to say something like Shenmue for example. While it can be a bit boring, it's here that I can gush about my favorite feature of Moon, the music system. The early game of Moon features mostly ambience, with the occasional music track depending on what area of the game you're in. Not too far into the adventure, however, you come across this guitar-playing hippie named Burn. Burn is a record salesman, and he can sort through and purchase the wide variety of music he possesses. You get a lot covered here as well, pop, hip-hop, dance, electronic, folk, classical, about nearly every popular music genre you could think of is represented here. The cutest touch is that the only hint you get for what the song sounds like is by these personal summaries from Burn, who goes into abstract details over each piece. I'm sure he'd be great sharing some of his opinions on Rate Your Music. As someone with somewhat of a musical background and who enjoys listening to a bunch of new music, this way of earning music tracks is adorable and something I've never experienced in another game. I love that each song has its own vinyl cover, all with different art styles to represent the vibe each piece has. And once you obtain any music track, you can curate a playlist that you can customize at any time as you explore the world. I could spend so much more time just discussing each song featured here and my opinion on each track, so it's for the best that I cut it short here. Uh, long story short, I highly recommend you check out the soundtrack for this game even if you don't intend on playing Moon. It's one of my favorite soundtracks I've heard in a video game and just a unique experience all around. Overall, Moon is a heartwarming and charming experience that I'm glad I discovered. The cutesy clay-like art style combined with the humored cast of characters creates a world like no other and one that I enjoyed revisiting for this video. I actually played this game on the Switch, but it's now been released on both Steam and PlayStation, so go ahead and choose your platform of choice. Honestly, I'm glad that I was able to learn of Onion Games' existence and learn that they still are with their indie game roots. Funny enough, the reason I learned about Onion Games' existence was looking into the background of another game that Yoshido Kimura had a hand in. You see, after Love the League's closure, each dev went on to continue work in different ways. The most prominent being the leader of Love the League, Kenichi Nishi, who went on to work for Nintendo on games like Tingle's Rosy Rupee Land and the Japanese exclusive Captain Rainbow, which definitely explains the quirky influence those games feature. <laughs> Back to Love the League though, Yoshiro Kimura ended up forming a new indie studio called Punchline. The studio had unfortunately only been around for a few years before its closure, but both games developed by the studio saw an international release this time around unlike Love the League's past ventures. One of them was Rule of Rose, a horror game I'd actually like to experience someday, and one that has its own set of controversies. The other game though is a bit more obscure, but it was the one that I had an immediate interest in playing after seeing gameplay of it for the first time. That game being Tulip. The first title to be released by Punchline, Tulip came out in Japan in 2002, followed by a re-release five years later in America in 2007 as a GameStop exclusive. Unsurprisingly, the sales of the game went way under expectations. The story of Tulip follows a young boy and his single dad moving into the neighborhood of Long Life Town, where the boy meets the girl of his dreams, literally, as she matches the looks of a girl he saw himself kiss while under the fabled lover's tree. He plans on writing her a love letter in the hope she'll fall for him, but the letter is rejected when he puts it in the mailbox. Turns out this was done by an underground resident and teacher of Long Life Town, Mr. Suzuki. Suzuki tells the young boy that if he wants to be able to win the heart of the young girl, he's going to have to strengthen his heart in the only way possible. By kissing as many people as possible. 
Chulip is very much a spiritual successor to Moon in its gameplay, unsurprising given that Kimura was once again head director of the game. Within the world you have what are considered the overworld town residents and then the underground residents filling the spots that the monsters filled in Moon. With overworld residents you gain information that relates to the struggles they're currently facing, while with underground residents they require you to wait for them to come out of their holes at certain times and solve a puzzle relating to them. You have a day and night system to track characters, and once the opportunity presents itself, you can catch a kiss from said person. You even level up the same by going to bed and having your dad recap the people you've kissed. Or be disappointed in you, either or. While Chulip's gameplay is extremely similar to Moon, there is one big difference in its gameplay. Moon emphasizes the cozy and gentle atmosphere of the game and rarely at all has events or characters that are deemed hostile towards you. Chulip throws that philosophy out the window and reminds you, hey, the world and people around you can be dangerous or frightening at a moment's notice. Instead of the timer indicating how long you can wander around, the game has an actual health bar represented by these heart points, which is what you'll be leveling up as you gain more kisses. When first starting Chulip, there is not a moment's notice where you aren't at risk of being harmed. Dig through the trash to find mounds of poop. Get barked at by a dog, mess up certain acts in helping people, and they'll slap or punch you in a moment's notice. Drink this bad tea that'll nearly kill you. Whoops, you messed up this dance. Sorry, we're gonna berate you and that's gonna injure you. Occasionally, there's even a couple moments where it's required to be injured if you plan on getting around. The world of Tulip does not fuck around, and unless you're a fan of some trial and error, this game will definitely be a bit more of a turnoff than Moon. While this can be a problem, I do think this plays into the game's story and overall message of maturity for the young boy in the people of Long Life Town. Without getting too much into spoilers for the game's climax, the game starts to show the bigger picture while leveling up and increasing the heart of the young boy does for him. While the end goal is to win the heart of the girl, the journey that it takes to get there and the way you're able to change the hearts around you shows the boy has grown to be a welcoming and great person to his community. There's a subplot throughout the game focusing on the player attempting to put together a love letter set that was taken from Mr. Suzuki by disgruntled teachers, and it's up to you to show your worth to each teacher, whether that be climbing through the corporate ladder or just convincing one of them that you believe in UFOs. By completing the main storyline of each area of the game, you get one step closer to obtaining the love letter set and learning a valuable lesson from each teacher. It's not the most complex or deep meaning storyline, but the message I found to be just as cute as it was in Moon. I never would have expected to be invested into either game as much as I was, but Tulip and Moon are both wonderful and honestly pretty down to earth experiences for games released during this era. I think what you're able to put up with in regards to gameplay is what will determine if you truly love either game, no pun intended. But I think that's fine. These games are niche for a reason, and outside of a couple of drawbacks, I think the noble ideas feature to leave a pretty impactful experience. And also, shout out to Love the Leak and Punchline for developing these games and making them as cool as they were, and of course Yoshiro Kimura for still going strong as an indie dev. Besides working on new projects with Unnamed Games, he occasionally uploads videos to their YouTube channel as well, going into the dev history of past games he's worked on. His videos discussing Tulip's development definitely helped the research on this video. It seems like he's approaching retirement soon, however, as he's directing his last major game with Onion Games, an RPG at that. So, hopefully, it turns out fantastic and continues the strange and quirky world that not only Moon and Tulip features, but his team's more recent indie titles. This now leaves me with the last game in my retrospective down memory lane. I've highlighted games that, while showing some of the downsides that come with this genre, end up still being pretty remarkable or charming enough to play. And while I enjoyed discussing these games, I wanted to choose one last game that I feel pushed how archaic or weird one of these adventure games could get. Something that was so niche and non-mainstream that only the truest of connoisseurs could find enjoyment out of it. And I, thankfully, was able to land on a game that represents this. A game that I actually only played for the first time fairly recently. It doesn't get any better than this. So what is Flower, Sun, and Rain? Well, it is a game. To be more serious, Flower, Sun, and Rain is a game developed by a grasshopper manufacturer and helmed by none other than Suda51, a name that's at least somewhat familiar with many for at least developing the No More Hero series. Released in 2001 for the PS2, Flower, Sun, and Rain was the second game to be developed by the company, and a sequel to their first title, The Silver Case, a visual novel adventure epic for the PS1. 
The sequel instead plays like a standard 3D title, though the story is still just as important as it was in the first game. Outside of the somewhat unapproachable status of the game, this game features similar enough elements to the previous games I talked about, which is why I want to give it a spotlight. Only one problem, the PS2 release never came out internationally, and currently there is no full English translated patch to try it out. What we did receive, however, was a Nintendo DS port, remake, demake thing, between 2008 to 2009. As you can see, it's not the best looker compared to the PS2 version, but if it's what we gotta make do with, so be it. The story of Flower, Sun, and Rain follows Sumio Mondo, whose job is to work as a searcher. You know, someone who searches for stuff. Nothing more. His job has brought him to Los Pass Island in an attempt to stop a terrorist attack that's been rumored to be occurring on a departing airplane. Greeting Sumio is the overseer and hotel manager of the island, Ido McAllister, a curious individual that made the call for Sumio to come to the island. Sumio is allowed to stay the night before making the journey to the airport, but the next day that begins his departure, strange occurrences prevent him from doing so. It always seems that something is blocking his way there, either that or a resident of the hotel asking for the help of Sumio. Getting caught up in the helping act, Sumio suddenly takes notice of a nearby airplane taking departure, for suddenly blowing up in the sky. This is then followed by him waking up from what he believes was simply a bad dream, but quickly comes to realize that something must be amiss on the island, his only theory being that an endless time loop is occurring. This makes up the gameplay of Flower, Sun, and Rain, as you take control of Sumio and uncover the hidden background of the island and help out hotel residents along the way. Unlike the previous games with their day and night systems, progression in this game is split up into the different time loops Sumio experiences. Each day you progress, the further that Sumio can escape the hotel and make it to the airport. Needless to say, each day gets weirder and weirder the more you progress, thanks to the strange patrons of the hotel. Everyone here, including the employees, love to nag at Sumio or plot him for his help, much to the dismay of Sumio's opinions. Sumio is just too nice of a guy according to many of the residents, which even he can admit. He even bought $5,000 worth of Girl Scout cookies just because. Humor is at the forefront of Flower, Sun, and Rain, whether that be through the character dialogue, visual humor, or even the fourth wall breaks. The absurdity that leads to the problems of each event needs to be seen to be believed. This game is easily one of the funniest games I've played. In a way, I'd even say the poor graphics of the DS version enhance the humor. I love when the game does these dramatic face zooms because I just can't help but laugh, and it wouldn't surprise me if Suda51 thought the same. Depending on your experience of the game, however, I'd say some of the ways the game pushes its humor can be a detriment to the actual gameplay. The majority of the gameplay in Flower, Sun, and Rain requires you to run around both the hotel and across Los Pass Island to solve puzzles that will allow Sumio to make it to the airport. The puzzles themselves are very strange, having Sumio hook up his handy suitcase Catherine to a person, or as one guy explains it to Sumio, Jack in. <laughs> Weird guy saying stuff like, come on inside me. All of the solutions to each puzzle are number answers, something that you figure out within the Lowe's Pass Island pamphlet that Ido McAllister gives to you at the beginning of the game. As an example, Sumio needs to help these two comedians move their luggage to one of the upstairs hotel rooms, not to mention it's blocking the entrance to the hotel, so Sumio has no choice but to help them out. Within the brochure, you find an advertisement section of the radio that the two comedians have. A certain number combination is needed to convert the radio into a smaller stature, so once you figure that out, you type the number into Catherine, and there you go, you figured out the puzzle. I feel even doing a step-by-step -step process on how puzzle solving in this game works is confusing, but I swear, the more puzzles you face, the more the system starts to make more sense. It's meant for the players to examine and go through the entire brochure to familiarize themselves with each puzzle. Not to mention, each section details past events or locations of Lowe's Pass Island, giving the players more background history behind certain events of the game. Probably the biggest sticking point against Flower, Sun, and Rain, though, is testing the player's patience by running around the island. With previous games discussed, walking around and immersing yourself within the world I found to be pretty fun, especially since there was a lot to interact with in said world. In Flower, Sun, and Rain, running around is the name of the game, but unlike previous games discussed, there is not much to explore or interact with on Lost Pass Island. While that's not the main focus of the game, the story between the cast of characters is more important, the game requires you to run between each area of the island without much to really do in the meantime, and the poor graphics of the DS doesn't help with the scenery. 
You don't have any form of transportation either due to the island's environmental upkeep, so your own legs are all you can rely on. The game definitely pokes fun at this though. There is even a whole chapter dedicated to Sumio dreading each run through the island, even asking if he could just fade to block to get to where he needs to be. And while this is funny the first time going through the chapter, it wears out its welcome on revisits of the game. The humor and story are really what keeps my attention in Flower, Sun, and Rain and its narrative ties to the Silver Case. Would I recommend this game to other people? Eh. The real answer is, if you're interested, I recommend checking out the Silver Case first before diving into this one. There are certain story elements later on that will just be confusing for first time players. Crazy to think that this game got localized before the Silver Case. While maybe not as well designed or as engaging as the previous games discussed, I find Flower, Sun, and Rain to be such a strange and fascinating experience for the era that I just had to highlight it. Suda51 has discussed interest in releasing a remake or a port of the PS2 version, so maybe not all hope is lost for experiencing a non-portable slash emulated version of the game. Flower, Sun, and Rain truly is the game of all time. And on that note, that about wraps up my retrospective on each game I wanted to discuss. Researching and analyzing each of my replays ended up being fairly informative and more fun than I thought it'd be. The games in the order I discussed mostly follow the timeline of when I played through them from beginning to end, and as I went along originally, even back then I noticed similarities in each game that I found myself enjoying. Being able to read interviews and certain viewpoints that led to each game's story or gameplay was also pretty cool. Yu Suzuki's strive for realism in trips to China to replicate real-life fighting styles in Shenmue, Kimura sharing relationships he formed in between game development and the way this sparked new ideas for his games, even just Aiji Aonuma sharing nightmares on the somewhat stressful deadline Majora's Mask imposed on him and how this was reflected within the game. I find the more down-to-earth and somewhat relatable setting each game has, even with their more fantastical elements, is what makes these games have such an emotional attachment to me. Even while researching and editing for these specific games, I still found myself discovering or keeping tabs on future games to try out. One example was Chibi Robo, a game that I've known about for quite some time but never got to actually play. Running around as a cutesy robot and ensuring that the daily lives of the family that purchased you matches the more abstract style of adventure sim games I was looking for. And what would you know, it's developed by Kenichi Nishi, previous head owner of Love the Leak. While I mainly focus on games from the 5th to 6th generation of consoles for a reason, I'd love to hear more about or play other adventure sim style games new or old. And I don't know, maybe if you want to share some in the comments I'd appreciate that and maybe you would let me keep tabs on games I should try out in the future. Thank you for watching the video anyways though, it means a lot to me and I already have a couple other ideas for videos that I'd like to get out at a pretty quick pace, hopefully it doesn't take me however many months as it took to make this video.